So today, I, <clears throat> on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, I want to spend some time analyzing, showing you the background to a poem that I wrote years ago. <clears throat> in, uh, at this stage in my life, I've been writing some poetry. And this is a poem that was inspired by the shofar ritual. Virtually all of the poems that I've written, I write it and then I sit down with Rabbi Ezra, who means so much to us. Ezra really has had much more experience in writing poetry. And although the thoughts step by step are basically, you know, humbly they're my own, but Ezra has helped me shape the verbiage and, and the words. And you should know, Steve, that Gillian has, Gillian edited all of Loving Torah. So I'm very grateful to your family, Steve, for that. So Shuli has the poem, and we're going to put it up. It's actually a long poem. And if we <clears throat> just do a couple of the paragraphs, I'll be happy. And so Shuli, if you have that, here's what it says. First paragraph, I guess I'll read five paragraphs, it has 10 or 11, from narrow straits to broad relief, ram's strength in bowed humility, smooth and youthful and wrinkled and aged, ever blown everywhere, ever distinct. Abraham chooses life. Rachel refuses comfort. Joshua shatters walls. Paratroopers liberate home. A song for Korach's children. Descendants forge anew. Don't blast, listen. Don't hear, listen. Exhale the breath God blew into Adam. Turn up the volume on the soul's inner voice. A plea, demand, cry. A song, dance. Prayer, silence, a solo, a harmony, a trumpet coronates God, a symbol startles us, awake, a drum rallies, gather round, a flute sings of love. A curved trail, up, down, up. Tikiya, shvarim truwa. Tikiya, blasting success, wailing despair, heralding rebirth, higher still, creation. Revelation, redemption. Ayeka, Hineni, Yitaka. Where are you? Here I am, the great chauffeur. Shattered vessels fixed. Good deeds supplant bad. Love overpowers hate. Light pushes out darkness, sounds ascending, descending, meeting in liminal space, drawing earth to
to heaven, heaven to earth, sealing the covenant. Kiagidola. And this poem was translated by my dear, dear friend, Dr. Avigdor Shinan whose Hebrew is breathtaking. And so Sheila, if we can go to the top and I'll only read the first paragraph in the Hebrew and you'll see how his Hebrew is just remarkable. So what does he say? Shuli, if we can just move it to the right a bit so I can see it. The other way? Thank you. Can't really um, move it like okay. that. I see it. I see it now. Okay. In Hametzar Hatzar El Harvacha Harchava Atzmato Shel Haayu Baanavak Fuvak Chalak Vitzagir Vizakin Umalei Kmati Kolo Nishma Echozman Echomakom Ach Tamid Milchad. So I want to say something about the first paragraph to give you an idea of our movement. Each paragraph attempts to deal with a different aspect of the shofar. The first paragraph deals with its very feature. That is, its, it, its look. When one looks at the shofar, it is a, not only a remarkable sound, and a remarkable instrument, but the very artistry of the form of the shofar is quite beautiful. And the Talmud spends a lot of time describing the shofar. And in this first paragraph, we mention some of the ideas that come from the Talmud, but ideas coming from the Talmud are not meant to stifle our input, but to inspire everyone to offer their own approach. So we're gonna go back to the paragraph and we'll take it line by line. And after the paragraph, we'll stop. And I'd like to ask you to think about when you hold the shofar, the texture of the shofar, when we look at the shofar, what sentiments, what feelings does it evoke? And so, from narrow straits to broad relief, from narrow straits to broad relief, let me face everyone, the narrow straits refers to the narrow aperture from which the shofar is blown. The aperture, the hole, is very, very small. From narrow straits to broad relief, because the shofar then moves through that hollow horn and it emerges from a much larger area to broad relief. And it reminds one of the sentence in the Psalms, Min karatika, out of distress I call upon the Lord. Anani bamerchavka, answer me, O God. By offering me relief from distress to relief. 
Now that could mean many things. Generically, uh, well, for this thought, often in life, we feel the distress. We feel like our vessels, there's a certain closure, there's a stenosis, like the world is, is collapsing on us. I feel the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And I cry out to God, Anani, answer me, Bamerchavka, answer me by offering relief. This is what many of us felt in the Yom Kippur, in the Six Day War, when in fact Israel was so narrow and we were being threatened by those who were claiming Nasa claiming he's going to push the Jews into the river. We all remember this. And by the end of six days, suddenly Israel was, who knows how many times its size, the Golan, Yudan, Shomron, Sinai, Anani, and we're about ready to remember the Yom Kippur War. What a terrible terrible war. And I know there's much talk about the new goal of the film. I still believe that the person who was most responsible for the tremendous losses that we had in the thousands was America's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, who pressured Golder when Golder realized that there was going to be a surprise attack he pressured Golder not to be the first one in. No preemptive strike. Let no one say that the Jews are attacking first. And then he promised that whatever happens, America won't step in. And after the third army was surrounded miraculously, miraculously, of course, the war was called to a halt by Kissinger and the Soviet leader, I'm not sure who it was. It was, I believe by that time it was, it was Brezhnev. And uh, there's a rabbinic story about someone after the war visiting the holy Israeli troops. Many, many were wounded seriously. And he was singing the song that comes from, from the writing of the of the cuts of the Kutska, Kol Haolam Kulo, or is it with Nachman? I'm forgetting. Kol Haolam Kulo, Geshet Sar Maod. The whole world is a very narrow bridge. The Haikar Lo Lefachid Klau. The main thing is don't be afraid. And the rabbi was offering all kinds of theological explanations. Oh, the world was narrow for us on the first day of the war, the fourth day of war, when Dudu El Azar, who was then the chief of staff, unfairly blamed by the Agron Commission for what had unfolded. And he said, we're going to push back. But on the fourth day of the war, Israel faced, God forbid, Israel faced the end. It's a very, very serious time. But somehow, it was relief. Or the rabbi explained, it means life could be a very narrow bridge, just a narrow bridge. And you seek from the straits, we seek relief in our lives. Or on a very personal level, the last time I went for an angioplasty, a stenting, I felt the narrowness, I could feel the vessels to my heart were closing. There were certain moments I felt that angina. And I prayed to God, God, let the angioplasty, let the stents this, this time, let them work. I'm seeking relief. And when the rabbi was through, a soldier called him over and said, I appreciate all of your explanations, but everybody understands this in their own way. So 
So let me tell you what that song, the whole world is an arrow bridge, but the main thing, don't be afraid. Let me tell you what I think it means. When the Egyptians attacked, I was in the Sinai. And then Ariel Sharon threw pontoon bridges over the Suez Canal. And he told us this narrow bridge represents the lifeline of the Jewish state. And you have to guard this bridge with your lives. And he said, I did whatever I could. And it was there that I was seriously wounded. And for me, when I hear these words, I say that night, the whole world was that narrow pontoon bridge across the canal. But the main thing was to believe, to have confidence that there would be relief, that somehow we would make it. So let's go back to the text. That is in the first line. These poems take a long time to write. I would say this poem on the chauffeur took several months to put together. When one looks at the chauffeur, one can't help but notice. It's from narrow straits to broad relief. Min hametzar, we quoted that sentence. Hatsar, from the narrowness of the narrowness. El harvacha harvacha to the relief which is broad, which is open. Second line, ram's strength in bowed humility. Ram's strength in bowed humility, if I can face everyone. Ram's strength in bowed humility. This is a ram's horn. Ram's strength. The ram is a very powerful, very, very strong animal. And that sound is coming from the ram's horn. But the Talmud says that the shofar must be a shofar kafuf. It's not a straight horn. It's a ram's horn that is kafuf, that bows, it's curved. And the curvature represents a humility. What is this all about? I'm wondering, maybe it means that we should remember that in those moments that we think that we're at the top of the world, that's when we are most vulnerable. When athletes get up after a game and declare that they're invincible, watch out, watch out, because the precipice is not far away. Ram's strength in bowed humility. One of my favorite passages in the Talmud is in Megillah, where it says, Follow God's ways. And what are those ways? Bimakom gidulato, sham anvitanuto. In the place where you see God's strength, precisely there, does one see God's humility. And walking in God's steps, this, in the spirit of in the Tatio Dei, the Allah Tobit Rachav is our challenge. That precisely when we think we're strongest, stay humble. Ram's strength, Ram's strength in bowed humility. Let's look at the text and we'll go to the third line. Ram's strength. Bowed you. The Hebrew for that was Atzmato Shelaayil. Atzmato is the strength. Ba'anava, humility. Kfufa, 
bent over. Third line, smooth and youthful and wrinkled and aged. Smooth and youthful and wrinkled and aged. What is this about? Smooth and youthful? Well, when we look at the shofar and we touch it, parts of the shofar are very smooth. And it seems to emanate a youthfulness. The times when we look into the mirror, no lines. Our skin is smooth. We look so youthful. And yet when we continue brushing the shofar, when we continue doing so, there are bumps in the shofar. And maybe that evokes the wrinkles, the lines, the agedness, if I can face everyone. Small, youthful, wrinkled, and aged. And maybe the shofar talks about the curve of life. That's what life is. Kachalom ya'uf. Like a dream, it flies away. And yet, truly, if, if I could face everyone, it's so important that at all of these stages in life, whatever stage of life we are, at least this is a personal perspective, that the young not only remain with the young, but that the young interact with the older. And it's often the case that the older folks are staying only with the older folks. And one of the cornerstones of the Bayit was to make sure that our community is intergenerational. For me, that is so critical. Were I able to, I would say that even our day schools would gain from being intergenerational, not just for one program, but there should be a way of bringing in people with more of life experiences to study with younger people. I know that's radical and it's a call for change and there would be a, a real pushback but I wonder about that. Wouldn't we better off on Hillel's for four years? Young people are only with young people. Intergenerationality is so important. And so the chauffeur speaks to all ages. And it's a call for everyone to come together. It's a call to remind all of us that there should be a place in Judaism for youth, or as the Yankees, when they were winning a couple games in a row, they said, we have the youth, but it should also be a place for the seniors, for those who are often pushed aside because people think as we get older, we have less to offer. I think the reverse is true, the older we become, more wisdom of life that one has. And so the last line of that first paragraph, and then I'd like to open it up. Let's take a look at that paragraph. First, the third line in Hebrew, chalak, smooth, v'tsa'ir, and young, v'zakin, and older, umalei k'matim, full of wrinkles. And then we write, sort of as a synopsis, ever blown, everywhere, ever distinct. Ever blown means that this shofar which we're blowing is not just the shofar for modern times, but it was forever blown. This shofar was blown by our parents and grandparents going back to Sinai, even before Sinai, ever blown, and it will be blown 
for decades and probably millennia to come. Everywhere, no matter where one attends synagogue, no matter the denomination, everywhere there's the shofar, whether in America, whether in France, whether in the former Soviet Union, ever blown, everywhere, ever distinct. That is to say that yes, the shofar is the same as the one blown in the past. It's the same shofar blown everywhere. And in that sense, it unites us vertically to our past and to the future. And it unites us horizontally and democratizes all communities. We're blowing the same shofar, but in the same breath, there are no two shofar wrote, no two chauffeurs that look alike. Just as no pe two people have the same fingerprints, so too no two people have the same soul prints. Every shofar is unique. Every shofar is distinct. And so, in Hebrew and then in English, min hametzar hatzar el harvacha harchava atzmato shel ha'ayel ba'anava kfufa chalak v'tzair v'zaken umelei kmatim kolo nishma b'chol zman b'chol makom ach tamid miyuchad from narrow straits to broad relief rams strength in bowed humility smooth and youthful and wrinkled and aged ever blown, everywhere, ever distinct. I pause here for your thoughts, reflections, questions, by all means. I see Lance's hands. I see Tova's hands. Am I missing anyone? I guess we'll start with uh, Lance, Tova, and Arnie. Okay. Um, I would only like to suggest, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I would only like to suggest that within Teruah is uh, the Hebrew word Terah. Now, Terah is actually the father of Abraham. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So in the book of Joshua, in Joshua's final speech to the Israelite leaders assembled at Shechem, Joshua recounts the history of God's formation of the Israelite nation, beginning with Terah, the father of Abraham. So from my point of view, the sacred message embedded in the shofar is the state of Israel. Beautiful. Yes. And we're going to touch on that in a moment. You'll see, Lance. As a matter of fact, we're going to open it up further. But if we can go back to the poem, I'm going to do the second paragraph, but much more quickly. We're not going to be able to finish the whole poem, but I'll be happy to send it to you for your review. And also, we had a chance to write a commentary on it. So if we can go back to that poem, and the second paragraph really takes off from the fourth line where we wrote ever blown, that the shofar goes all the way back. And so we offer examples of going back. Now, Lance, you'll see when we get to the fourth line how what you just said now is what pushed me to read these lines. So Baruch She Kivanti, Abraham chooses life. This refers to that moment of the binding of Isaac, where Isaac was about ready to be slaughtered. The angel tells 
Abraham, no slaughtering, the no slaughtering of your son. And at that moment, Abraham learns that God doesn't want that we die for him, but that we live for him. Abraham chooses life and he replaces Isaac by looking to the side and he sees a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And the rabbis say that in life, we're often caught in the thicket by whatever catches into the thickets. In Abraham's case, it was, it was the horn. And Abraham takes the ram and it takes the place of Isaac as Abraham chooses life. Moving on, Rachel refuses comfort. This refers to the prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31 where when, according to the Midrash, as the Jews were exiled to Babylonia, they pass Rachel's grave. And Rachel, the prophet says, Ko birama nishma, the voice is heard in Rama. And when one looks at the words ko shma, those are the exact words that are used in the blessing over the shofar. And what it says there is, Rachel refuses to be comforted and she calls out to God, the shavu vanim ligulam, the children must return to their borders. I actually believe that there's a more literal way of understanding the history of Rachel's call, that it doesn't only refer to the Babylonian exile, but it refers to the time when the 10 tribes were exiled and she's calling for the reunification of the 10 tribes with Judah which makes much more sense because Rachel was Joseph's mother more, Ephraim more in touch with, with the 10 tribes. And who knows, since the language is maybe she was blowing the shofar, calling out to God, the shavuvan in the vula. And of course, Joshua, shatters the walls. Joshua circles the city of Jericho seven times. And then on the seventh day, seven times, and then blasts the shofar, and the walls come tumbling down. We're getting closer, Lance, as Joshua liberates the first city to be liberated in the liberation of Israel after the Jews cross the Jordan after wandering in the desert for 40 years. And Joshua shattering the walls that has in mystical literature become the hope that whatever walls between people, between couples, between parents and children, that those walls be removed so that there be an interconnection. But the chauffeur was also blown, Joshua, shatters the walls and then in modern times in 1967 when Israeli troops liberated Jerusalem paratroopers liberate home when the paratroopers came into Jerusalem what did they do they blew the shofar and who can forget the words of that correspondent who at the Kotel in tears said, dati. I'm not a religious man. This is the Kotel. So the second paragraph speaks to the history of the shofar ever blown. Abraham chooses his life all the way back. Rachel, the wife of Jacob, refuses comfort 
Joshua shatters walls. Paratroopers liberate home. Avraham bachar bachayim. Rachel me'ana be'inachem. Yehoshua motet chomot. Sanchanim shechuru et habayim. So if I could face everyone and let's continue your comments. We've done a paragraph about the physicality of the shofar and then a paragraph about the history, the ever blownness, if you will, of the shofar. Thank you, Lance. Any thoughts? I think they were. I think we had Tova and then Arnie. Ravavi, could I just make one quick point? Yeah, quick point. Okay, yes. if you look at your home, it is not logical. It is not vertical. It is actually horizontal. It's what um, Edward de Bona calls lateral thinking or tangentiality. And that is, in my view, a hierophany or um, really the ruach the voice of God, which is also in the word teruah. And I would suggest, Rav Avi, that this poem is actually the voice of God speaking through you. I was very impressed by this poem. The poem is brilliant. Thank and whoever you. translated it does even more with the Hebrew. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth that I, you know, writing it in English, giving it to Professor Vigdashanan, when I called to thank him, I said, Avigdor, I have one problem. Your Hebrew is so beautiful. It's so much better than my English that I have to rewrite the English. I just didn't have the strength to do that, but I couldn't agree with you more, Lance. So, Shuli, I think Tova wanted to say, my dear Tova. Tova and then Tova has, a great, uh, Tova has a great appreciation for the language. Yes. I think you're on mute, Tova. Yes, yeah, sorry. I had to mute everybody because there was background noise. Now, I, now we can hear you. You know, when you describe the, the shofar, and the wrinkled and the aged, but remember the shofar is also bent. It's never a, just a straight instrument. And I think that also represents not only the old, but the handicapped. I love that. Tova, thank you so much. I have to include that in the commentary. And it's, um, you know, when you write, it's a writer's dream. When people see in the writing something that the writer didn't even think about. And, and I, I'm I should have thought of that, though. I make you thought of it. Thank you. On, on the second paragraph, when yes. you say Abraham chose life, no. Abraham chose his son's death. He was ready to slaughter his son. Right. It was a ram that he learned. No. Human life, child sacrifice. This right. is not yes. us. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. Yep, yep. And the ram taught him to choose life, to choose yep. life. Yep, I hear. Thank you, Toba. And now Arnie. Yeah. Um, so I'm struggling with some thoughts right now, Avi. Um, I'm I'm kind of feeling that the uh, the shofar is both wide and narrow at each end. It does just go from the narrow to the wide. When when we use language at the narrow end, language consists of sounds broken up into tiny units and we have to use our thoughts and feelings 
which swirl around to produce these sounds that are language. That's a very complicated thing. And we're all doing it in different ways and coming out with different products, different language. So even when we say the prayer before the shofar, we're saying the same words, but it means so many refracted things to each of us. It's a very complicated, wide thing that's going into a very narrow end. Yes. At the wide end, there's this, it, it takes all these refracted sounds and makes one long, beautiful sound. But as you pointed out, that long, beautiful, simple sound is heard in every country where there are Jews, in every time period when there are Jews. It's heard and, and interpreted. Feelings are raised, thoughts are created, completely different from one person to another. So it's very, very narrow, very complicated, simple, but complicated. It, 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 it excuse me. Um, so I'm just struggling to make sense out of that. It's like kind of blowing my mind that I can't just see it simple at one end. I mean, narrow at one end and big at Right. Yeah. Right. What I'm hearing you say that, and 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 you say, you know you say it so beautifully. You know, everyone can see different things in whatever one writes, but it sounds like you're saying that there's there's an openness in the narrowness, and there's a narrowness in the openness. Is that exactly? Yes, and I think that's beautiful. I think it was Yehuda Amichai who read the Ecclesiastes. There's a time for everything, time to love, a time to make war. <clears throat> he says, nah, I don't got time to divide that. <clears throat> you know, in war, you make love. In love, you also sometimes could be at war. It's all, I like that. Thank you. Take one more comment and we'll do one more paragraph. <clears throat> yes. I see Alan's hands. Alan, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure how a shofar is made. And I don't really know what it looks like before it's handled. But I think that I would assume that the horn has to be smoothed out on the inside as well as um, whatever is done to the outside. And so there's an element to all of this of man that, that gives it its Great. ability to speak. Whoa. It's not just that it's the ram's horn and the strength and the bowing and the humility, but the, but there has to be input from man before it can do any of those things. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know. That's a beautiful thought. I, uh, if we can go back to the poem, and I don't want to hold you too long, but um, I'll send it out, and maybe tomorrow, next week, we can finish it. But, of course, Rosh Hashanah is this weekend. But if you look at it, <clears throat> I think first of all, I'll go through the third paragraph like chick chock. And the fourth paragraph touches on what Ellen just said. <clears throat> Although Ellen said it in, in a, a very beautiful, distinct way. The third paragraph, we're moving from the physicality of the shofar to the history and future of the shofar to the third paragraph, 
<clears throat> where we are in shul. And before we blow the shofar, it's a very anticipatory moment. And we say the 49th Psalm, La Natseach Livne Korach Mizmor, <clears throat> no less than seven times. A psalm for Korach's children, descendants forge anew. Because everyone knows that Korach in the Bible rebelled against Moses, and yet, and he swallowed by the ground, and yet his children composed many of the Psalms. And so it is fascinating that before we blow the shofar, we say this song, descendants forge anew. Whatever our past, of course we walk in our parents' footsteps, but sometimes when ne necessary, we have the capacity to do it our way. And parents who understand what it means being parents know how to step back and make room for their children to be who they are, not, not to be who the parents are, but to be who they are. My dream for my children is, okay, maybe they learn a little bit from, from, from their history, but I want them to be who they are. I want them to be the best that they can be. A psalm for Korach's children. Even though he was not anything to write home about, his children become the sweet singers of Israel, joining King David in the Psalms. Descendants forge anew. And that's the paragraph, as I mentioned, that we say. And then we say the blessing. The blessing is who has commanded us, Lishmoa ko shofar. Lishmoa, like Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, it's fascinating. You would think that we would, if I can face everyone, you would think that we should say the blessing. I bless you, O God, you has commanded us to blast the shofar. We don't say the koa shofar. I guess anybody can blast it. You can blast it as loud as you want. The question is, is one taking in the sound? That's the question. Lishmoa. And then the line says, and our role is not only to hear the shofar, although being hearing impaired, I have come to understand that great miracle to hear. But it's not only to hear, it's to listen. Listen is very different. Listen means I'm listening. Whenever I'm counseling, I try to see the word wait in front of me. W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? I want to give a chance. I want to listen to the other. So let's go back to the text very quickly. Here's what the third paragraph, which is the final preparatory paragraph before blowing the shofar, it says, a psalm for Korach's children, descendants for Janu. Don't blast. Listen. Don't hear. Listen, Shema Israel does not mean hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. It means listen, O Israel. Lam natseach livne Korach mizmor. Olam and then, Ellen, your point. The next paragraph, we're beginning to sound the shofar. And what is that sound? all about. Generically, I'm not talking about the specifics. The poem will deal with that a bit later. But more broadly, what is it about? 
here. If I could face everyone, let me tell you this. First, let me read it in the English. Let me go back to the, I'm sorry, Shuli. Going back to the poem, it says, exhale the breath. God blew into Adam. Turn up the volume on the soul's inner voice. Nishof et haruach ashenafach elokim badam. Hagber et atzmato shel kola hapnimi shel hanefesh. If I could face everyone, just this background. I've said this before, and I believe I may have touched upon this as recently as last week. Rosh Hashanah is a celebration of the creation of human being, and more specifically, the creation of breath. On that day, God breathes into Adam. That's male and female, breathes into Adam. The rib is really the bifurcation. Breathes into Adam his breath. Something that God didn't do for all other animal creation. It was a special breath that God blows into Adam. And we're the children of Adam. So God breathes that breath into all of us. And where does the sound of the shofar come from? doesn't come from the lips. That's not its source. It comes out from the lips. That's not its source. It doesn't come from the larynx. It comes from the inner breath. The inner breath. And the idea here that we're envisioning is we breathe out the breath that God breathed. In other words, as Ellen said, <clears throat> God creates the world. But the world, as we know, is not a perfect world. If it were a perfect world, it wouldn't be the world as we know it. And so God, in creating this imperfect world, says, I've now created the human being in partnership. Let's try to make this world a better world. Let's try to redeem. So Ellen, you said it very beautifully in the discussion of the physicality and it has its place there as well. We're saying it that in that sound, we're breathing out God's breath. We're partnering with God and we're trying to symbolize our mandate to fulfill God's wish fulfill God's wish that we allow this world to be a godly world, a goodly world. And then the poem says something like, raise the volume. You know, good chauffeur blowers, what they do is they don't start strong and end low. Some start low and end louder, louder. That's the way God blows the shofar. We try to imitate that often at the end of a marathon, we're at our weakest, but those who run those races know you better save your energy for the end. It's like taking care of somebody who is very dear to us. If we put all our energy in the first few days, we're not gonna have energy left. Raise the value, raise the value. And as Rabbi Cook says, from the inside, we breathe out the sound of the shofar to connect with God. And not only to connect with God, to do what God wants us to do, to connect with other human beings. And so let's go back to the text. I'll read this paragraph and I'll read the next with no explanation, comments, and then we'll stop. So let's take a look at it. What does it say? Going back to the video, it says, exhale the breath God blew into Adam. Turn up the volume 
on the soul's inner voice. If you could point to the place, my dear Shuli, Neshof et haruach, Ashenafach Elohim Ba'adam, Hagbed et atzmato, Shokola Hapnimi Shela Nefesh. Let the sound go forth. Let it be a godly sound that does its share. May we do our share. This is a beautiful world. If we would only keep it beauty, do our share to make it beautiful, more beautiful. And what is the sound? It's all of this. A plea. A plea. Demand. Cry. It's also a song, a dance, a prayer. And notice the third line is no first or third word. That's the silence, silence, a solo. Sometimes we sing our own song. Sometimes it's a harmony. And so what is the turn up the volume? It has a kind of rainbow, a rainbow, a, a, a rainbow impression, rainbow in the sense it's of many colors. It's a plea, demand, cry, a song, dance, prayer, silence, a solo, a harmony, bakasha. Tria, Zaka, Shira, Maho, Tvila, Shtika, Levad, Yachdav, Beteum, Meshulam. I can't stop, just one more. And the shofar, even though it's a ram's horn, it like, it's like different instruments in the symphony, what could it be? Maybe I hear a little bit of a trumpet in ancient history coronating God. That's what Sajja Gaon says, one of the early Gonin. Maybe as Maimonides says, it's a symbol, startles us, awake us. Uru Yishenim, it's that loud sign. You slumberers, wake up. The world's waiting to be improved upon. Maybe it's a drum that rallies and says, gather round. As Debbie Friedman used to sing, gather round. Gather down by the river. Or maybe quite the opposite. Maybe the shofar is a flute with the lover on one side of the mountain, and then the mountain drops down, and then there's a beautiful stream of water, and on the other side, on the top of another hill, the beloved, and they're playing the flute to each other. A flute sings of love. Chatzotrot mamlicha et ha'il. One more paragraph, I'm really holding you. And then we get to the specific sounds. A curved trail, up, down, up. What's the up sound? Tikiya, Shvarim, Chua is a broken sound. And then Tikiya, lasting success. That's that first Tikiya. But inevitably, there'll be moments of down. Shvarim, Chua wailing despair, but it's followed by tkiya, heralding rebirth, strength still. Derech mitakelet, 
עולה ויורדת. תקיעה, תקיעה, שברים שהוא אמור נה 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 נה, תקיעה, מכריזים על הצלחה, מבכים את הייאוש, מכריזים על התחדשות בכוח גדל וגבר, if I can face everyone. So the general sound is the breathing out, the partnership. The specifics is the victory. But inevitably, you can only go up if you've been down. And you can only go down if you've been up. They're built into each other. But when you go down, that's no reason for despair and pessimism. Kia. There'll be another sound, and we write, Ola umit kaber, and that sound afterwards, let it be a little bit longer than the first. May we learn from our mistakes and from the brokenness when we recover, take it even to a new level, a higher level. So I really much to come into and then we'll stop. Do I see any hands? Tova, you're muted again now. Um, yeah, um, I was thinking of what, what Ellen you know, said, and I think part of, of what she says tells us that within the chauffeur must be also human creativity. It's the human, the person who has to clean it out and polish it and make it, and make it right. Yes, yes, yes. And I think that our input into this chauffeur is, is important. Try to finish this poem because it leads to the last line, which is the Tkiagidola, the final blast after Yom Kippur. And only if you can, I fully understand if it's not possible. This Thursday is the Earth Side class, and I hope you find that of meaning. Thank you so much, Tobin. Anyone else want to have a final, final say, final comment? Can I ask you a question? Hello? My mood is on you. Hello? So, we hear anyone... you. We hear you, Stuart. I want to say something. This is a little different about Rabbi Ezra. That, that, that he get a position that, that he can be, be a pulpit rabbi? Can he teach anybody? What, what happened to Rabbi Ezra? I want to know that. I, I'm very, I'm very uh, uh, understanding about him. What, what happened to him? Did he get a good position? That's God willing. He's doing well. God willing. And maybe I'll ask. What? He's, he's very important. Wish everyone what? Uh, what? what? What happened to him? I think the rabbi's having a little bit of trouble with his internet. He's uh, in and out. So. Oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, I want to know what, 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 what was he saying? Very well. Doing well? Okay. I hope he gets a good position. Okay. We love Enjoy you. Very... Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Here's a message from Fern to everyone. How beautiful. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, everybody. Shana Tova to everybody.
And I tell God to be a sweet and peaceful year. Amen. And everyone good health. Amen. I'm going to take Definitely. down the image so everyone can see each other to say goodbye. Shana Tava. Shana Tava. Bye.